something. Uh, but man, I'm so glad you're all here this morning. Have you guys, did you guys enjoy worship this morning? Come on. Come on. I think Sam was going through my Spotify, my Spotify because that's like three of those songs are in my repeat list right now. And so I'm like, dang, speaking to my soul. And uh, I def- definitely uh, enjoyed our worship time this morning. Today we're going to be talking about uh, setbacks and setups. Okay, so we're taking a, a break from our, our normal programming. We've been in a series through the book of James, and uh, it's been awesome so far. If you haven't uh, caught any of those yet or you're missing one, go back and watch, and then uh, we'll be picking back, that back up next week as we continue to comb through the wisdom and the, just the knowledge and the, the Holy Spirit stuff that we can uh, apply to our lives in the book of James. And so make sure you guys are here next week for that. But I want to ask you a question. Have you ever felt set up before? Anybody else felt set up? Like, you know, maybe it was a date, maybe it was, you know, a job, maybe it was, you know, like, and I I mean like in a good way or a bad way, because there's there's both those. How about, have you had some setbacks in your life, right? So maybe you're humming along and things are going good, but then boom, there's a setback. I mean, those those two things sometimes are hand in hand and uh, could possibly be a similar. And so for many of us, when you look back over your life, you can pinpoint many moments when you felt, where you felt both those feelings, where you felt set up or you've experienced setbacks. I remember when I was in high school, I was raising money to go on a missions trip to El Salvador. And uh, it was an awesome, awesome time. I was like, super excited. And, uh, you know, we had to fundraise. You sent letters, all this stuff. And um, I sent letters out and I was still short. So I was like, I'm going to do some work. And so I'm, I'm calling people, you know, my youth pastor's calling people, hey, you need yard work. And he got a call from a gal and she's like, I have a lot of yard work. Send like, you know, send as many students as you need money. They could, they'll, they'll have a lot of work to do. And I'm like, okay. And so my youth pastor calls me and I'm like, sign me up. I will be there. So me and probably five other of my friends were supposed to be to, to go do this lady's yard. And so we show up. Um, that day, and I'm like, all right, you know, I'm ready to work. I like using my hands. I've done a ton of yard work. I had a lawn mowing business in fifth grade, so, you know, I made like a thousand bucks in the summer, which was crazy um, as a fifth grader uh, mowing our neighborhood lawns, and so I had a lot of Legos, so if you see our Lego box at home, that's mostly from my fifth grade year. Um, I had a lot of Legos. I need to work on, needed to work on a budget at that point, but I did learn, you know, money for gas, money for maintenance, all that stuff. Um, but so we show up at this house, this lady's house, and I'm like, all right, and I drive up, and I'm sitting out front, you know, I think we showed up, we were told to be there at 7.30 in the morning. So I show up, I'm waiting, and I'm the only one sitting out front of the house. And so I'm like, well, I'm not going to be like the only one that goes and knocks on the door. Well, 15 minutes go by, no one. And I'm like, 20 minutes go by, I'm like, well, she probably might think that no one's coming, so I go knock. I'm like, hey, it's Darren, you know, from the youth group, and we're here to, I'm here to do some yard work. There should be some other people showing up. And she's like, okay, let me take you around back and show you the yard work that needs to be done. And I'm like, all right, let's do this. And so we walk around to the backyard, and the, her backyard wasn't just a flat yard. It was like on a 35-degree angle, okay? And like it wasn't grass. It was all weeds. And she's like, I want that whole hill cleared. <laughs> let me tell you, I felt set up. Because that day, no one showed up besides me. And I ended up, I was like, well, I'm going to do this. And so I huffed through. I don't even think I did the whole thing. But I ended up getting most of the way up the hill, pulling weeds, dragging stuff out of there. And I remember going back and like, talking to my youth pastor. I was like, who else was supposed to be there? Like, I'm going to get them, you know, kind of thing. Um, but I felt set up, right? It was terrible. I, another story of, of feeling set up was uh, our, our first year of marriage. And I, I um, he was like, wait, uh, <laughs> with my amazing wife. <clears throat> I enjoyed worshiping with her this morning. Uh, and uh, our first year of marriage, you know, for an 18 and 19 year old, my wife and I got married young. I graduated high school at 16 and, you know, we went to college and then uh, we were dating at that point and got married at 18, 19. And so I had grown up with all brothers and, you know, I, I had lived in a dorm for two years at that point. And so joking was just a natural thing for me, right? Just joking around, having fun, poking fun, all of those things. And so I would began to just joke around with Danielle. And well, you know, the first couple months of marriage, that was funny. But then after a while, she kind of got tired of it. And, um, you know, it caused a lot of hurt feelings and some arguments. And, you know, because she was a woman, she had feelings. I was set up. <laughs> right? Right? She wasn't like my brother. She, you know, she wouldn't, you know, so I was set up. <laughs> right? What about those setbacks in our lives? What about those, those times when, We've, we're humming along and things are going good and everything is going up to the right and wham, 
Something hits you out of nowhere, and it shakes you to the core, and you feel overwhelmed. You feel like you're just, that you're, that you hit a ton of bricks. Your flawless, your flawless plan to accomplish X, Y, Z is shattered. Maybe it was your whole childhood. You were told that you could do or be anything you ever dreamed, but once you got into real adulting and reality set in, set in you learned real quick that you were set up, and there was problems there, that there were things you were set up to believe in something, set up to believe in a higher power called dreams. But that setup wasn't that you couldn't do all those things. The setup was that all those things revolved and hinged on you, not on God. You see, this type of setup most likely brought out upon a ton of setbacks in your life. Maybe a couple bad purchases, bad relationships, poor money management, hardships at work, you name it. These setbacks and these setups hit us from all directions. There's a guy in the Bible who faced many setbacks. And we're going to do a big gloss over of a story of a guy named Joseph who was found in the book of Genesis. So if you have um, your Bibles, you want to open them up, we'll be spending our time there. I'll, I'll be jumping around, so like, you won't be able to necessarily follow me. I'll have some highlight scriptures in there. But I'm going to try to tell you the story, which is, you know, spans Genesis 37 to 50, basically. I'm going to try to tell you his story this morning and really see how, how he was crushed, right? In that song, New Wine, he was crushed, he was pressed, and out of that, God's presence and God's plan was revealed. You see, Joseph was born into this crazy love triangle, if you know the history of the story, right? His father wanted to marry a woman named Rachel, who was uh, actually one of his family members. So he worked for her for seven years for her dad. And so he worked seven years, and as those seven years came to a close, he was ready to marry Rachel, his dad, Jacob. Um, his dad betrayed him and actually gave him the older daughter, Leah. And so he is now married to Leah, and his dad said, well, if you want Rachel, you have to work seven more years. And Jacob's like, well, Rachel's worth it. And so he worked seven more years to earn Rachel, to be able to marry her. Some would call it love, some would call it crazy. I don't know. And so the unloved Leah bore Jacob seven sons, or bore seven sons, Reuben, Simon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, and as well as the daughter, so seven kids. Um, six of them were sons, and his daughter, Deniah. Jacob had a concubine, Beliah, who gave birth to Dan and Neptali, and then while the other slave, Zilpah, gave him Gad and Asher. And so that kind of sets the stage for the family situation here, right? Brothers and sisters from different mothers, like all those different things. But Jacob favorited Rachel. That was who he loved the most. And, and through that, and because of that favoritism, God had you know, kept Rachel's womb closed. But Rachel's love was ultimately redeemed when she gave birth to a boy named Joseph. And Joseph, because of his love for, uh, because of Jacob's love for Rachel, Joseph became the favorite. And so that sets the stage for Joseph. It's a, it's a hot mess of a family, right? Like, put them on some kind of, you know, reality TV show and we'd all tune in and watch it because it's weird and crazy and all of that. But that set J Joseph up to be in this place where he was the favorite, where he was looked at by his brothers and sisters as more loved by their father than them. So jo Joseph was set up from the beginning. And so I want <coughs> to read this here um, because this, is, this shows kind of the, the love there uh, in Genesis 37 3 for, through 4. It says, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other's children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. Right, imagine that, you're in a family of tons of children, right, 12, 13, 14 children, and the youngest is the favorite, and he gets this sweet coat, it says a coat of many colors, and at that time, colors, this dye that went into this was expensive, it was, you know, it was very valuable to have multicolored clothes, because, you know, they had to, you know, draw these dyes out of plants and all of that, and so his father had most likely spent a ton of money on this garment and gave it to his youngest son. And now as the older brothers and the older siblings who've been working, who have, who have been, you know, struggling, have been doing all that stuff, they now see the baby. Any babies in the room like the youngest kids in here? Yeah, yeah, I see you guys. I'm an oldest kid, so I know what you guys do. Um, it's a bunch of punks, I tell you what. Um, no, I love my, my little brother. You see, family history, as we see with Joseph, can be a setup, and it can cause setbacks, 
So let's read on. Um, as Joseph begins to process this, as he begins to uh, just really step into who he is, he begins to have these dreams. And we read the story in, in Genesis 37, verse 5. It says, one night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him, hated him more than ever, right? And so they, he gets the coat. They don't like him. They can't say anything nice about him. Now he's telling these dreams, and they hated him more than ever. And so he's like, listen to the dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. And they're like, as brothers, you know, older siblings are like, dude, we will pound you into the ground, little bro. Like, I ain't bowing to you. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. And you're like, Joseph, you need to like keep your mouth shut, brother. Like, come on, man. Verse 9, it says, soon Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream, and he said, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as his brothers, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Right, it began this pondering inside of Jacob's mind. And so Joseph, this set, set him up. And so uh, the, your first blank there, your first thought there is that God dreams set us up for friction, right? These dreams that God was imparting into Joseph, that Joseph, you would lead a nation. Joseph, that you would be a man, that your family would come in a time of need and they would bow. But he didn't quite understand it, but God was cultivating these dreams inside of him, right? God dreams in our lives set us up for friction because a lot of times the people around us don't understand them. The people around us are the worst critics. Jesus even said it that even, uh, you know, a, a, a prophet in his own land, in his own hometown, can't even get through to him. And so here, Joseph is sharing that with him. We see this a lot today with the American dream versus the God dream. Right? The American dream is to gather as much as you can, to, to do it all, to, to achieve your dreams. But God's dream is that the world would know him. And so I ask you, if you ever have a dream in your heart or a dream to do something and that's being stirred up inside of you, look at it and say, man, God, is this you? Because everything that is God will point others to him as you process your dreams. And that might cause friction inside of you because you're like, man, I really wanted to do this. I really wanted to be this person. I wanted to have this amount of money. Begin to look at that through the frame and the lens of God. Let that cause friction inside of you. Because I'm sure it caused friction to Joseph because, I mean, he was already hated by his family. And then to have these dreams, he's like, I don't understand what's going on with me. I don't understand why God is choosing me and why I'm having these dreams. But he shared them. Ultimately, it comes down to this idea of me versus he. My dreams, my thoughts, my heart versus God's heart. God's heart is always love. God's heart is always others. And as we'll see in the story, God's heart was to save. God's heart was to help these people. And so I'll, I'll paraphrase this part of the story. So as Joseph is, you know, living this life, the brothers take the flocks out into the fields, and um, they're out there for a little while. And so Jacob says, Joseph, why don't you go find your brothers? And so he heads out, and he's looking for them, and he searches, and he asks somebody. They said, oh, they're probably over there. And so as he makes his way up, it says his brothers saw him from far away. And so his brothers see him coming up, and they begin to conspire. They begin to conspire, like, so maybe, what, what, if, we, what if we just kill him? What if we just take him out? Like, what if we take the favorite guy out, um, and then dad will have to pick a new favorite, and hopefully it'll be me. Um, and so they're like, they begin to conspire this way. But then they're like, no, nah, let's not do that, because we, we don't want the blood and the guilt on our hands, and so let's just throw him in a pit and leave him, right? That doesn't sound any better. Um, <laughs> and so as jo Joseph comes up, they... The, the brothers grab them, they throw them in a pit. And as, as they do that, they see an Ishmaelite trading caravan come through. And they said, well, instead of just letting him die, why don't we just sell him into slavery so that way he doesn't die and it's on somebody else's. And so they, do that. So they sell Joseph into slavery. Like I said, you can go back and read through the, the, the details of the story. I'm glossing over it. But he sold into slavery and he ends up in the house of Potiphar, who is one of the, one of the officers of the, of the Pharaoh. And it was, it was there that Joseph began to, you know, 
be activated to ministry. It was there that God was using Joseph um, even in that moment. In Genesis 39, 2, in the house of Potiphar, it says, The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of of his Egyptian master. The Lord was with Joseph. Right? So even though he'd you know, encountered this setback, even though he'd encountered this setup where his own brothers had set him up, thrown him in a pit, and sold him into slavery, God was with him. Even in prison, or even in this time, God was with him. So much so that Potiphar ended up putting him in charge of everything in his entire house. And Potiphar's house was blessed. Right? Because of David, because of God inside of David. And so as David took on all these responsibilities in the house that Potiphar put him in charge of everything. So much so the only thing he had to worry about what he was going to eat, right? That's, that's pretty intense. Like, hey, you can do everything. You can pick out my shoes, you know, all that stuff. Um, but I'm just going to worry about what I eat. And so as Joseph does this, Potiphar's wife comes and tries to seduce him and tries to um, get Joseph to sleep with him. And Joseph says no, and it says repeatedly she came after him. And he continued to say no. He says, I can't do this because the master has given me full control over his entire house. And this would be dishonoring to take you because you are his. So one time, finally, she grabs a hold of him when no one else is around. And he slips away, but he leaves his cloak. And she then cries and says that Joseph tried to assault her. And Joseph is then thrown in prison. And he's put in prison. But as we saw with Joseph in Potiphar's house, that God was with him and he succeeded in everything he did. We read in Genesis 39, 21 through 23, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed, right? Just imagine those those ups and those downs, those setups and setbacks that Joseph is feeling through these circumstances. Just imagine that. When we truly begin to see your next blanks here is that God is with us through our setbacks. God was with Joseph through his setbacks, through those hardships, through those times, and Joseph kept turning turning his heart not to his abilities, not to anything, but to the Lord, and because of that, he was blessed. Because of that, the people around him were blessed. Right? A prisoner was leading prisoners. It's crazy. The Lord was with Joseph. What if that became our definition when we walked through our trials, through our hardships, through our setbacks, that the Lord was with me? God was with me. And because of that, the people around me were blessed. Right? We'll see that Joseph wasn't necessarily like ripped out of prison at that point. He was still a slave in Potiphar's house, right? He did receive some, you know, aspect of goodness from the blessing that God had given him, but really it was about blessing others. It wasn't about him. So as we continue the story, Joseph's in prison and uh, two prisoners end up coming into the, the prison. One was the cupbearer, one was the, key, the king's baker, and they're in prison with Joseph and Joseph's over them and he takes the time to get to know them. And one day, they, these, both these guys have a dream. They have a dream. And so they're, they're trying to figure it out and they tell this dream to Joseph and one, the dream of the cupbearer was, you know, was Joseph interpreted and said that you're going to be reinstated as the king's cupbearer, which I don't know if I want that job because his job is to drink the, the, the wine or the drink beforehand, and if it's poison, he dies. Um, don't really want that job, but, you know, he's, he's going to get reinstated, but the baker wasn't going to be reinstated. He's basically going to die. So Joseph gave these guys their interpretation of the dreams. The next day, these guys are taken out of prison. The cupbearer is restored, and the baker's put, his head is put on a pole, right? Craziness. But Joseph told the baker or the the cupbearer to remember him when they were taken out. And so for two years, two years, Joseph waited in prison again after these guys had left. And then Pharaoh had some dreams. He had some dreams of 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 a famine coming, of of uh, these seven you know different things, uh, you know seven healthy cows and seven weak cows and seven good bushels of grain versus seven barren bushels of grain. And he says, what am I going to do with these dreams? What am I going to do with that? And the, and the cupbearer is like, oh, I know a guy. 
right? <laughs> like, have you ever had like that epiphany? You're like, oh, I know the person that could help us out here. The cupbearer is like handing the, the cup of wine to the Pharaoh and Pharaoh's talking about his dreams. The cupbearer's like, oh, yeah, I should probably drink this, but I know a guy um, who could help you, Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh brings Joseph before him, tells him the dream, and Joseph says, you know, it's going to be seven years of plenty, and there's going to be seven years of famine. And that's what these dreams meant, that God is, is preparing the people for this. And Joseph's like, hey, and if, you, if this is going to happen, you need somebody who's going to run your, your country, who's going to run your food, all, all that stuff, and take care of it to make sure that we stock up for these years of famine. And the Pharaoh's like, why not you? So Joseph is then taken and given basically the right hand, the right hand leader of all of Egypt. It says, Pharaoh took off his ring and gave it to Joseph and said, you're in control of everything besides my life. Right? God was setting Joseph up. And so for seven years, uh, he's, he, he helps store up the, the food inside of, e- of Egypt, and he stores it up. And then just like he had pro- prophesied, just like he had interpreted the dream, there was seven years of famine in the land. So the food stores was there, so much so they, so the, that the, they stopped counting because there was so much food. And so there we find Joseph. He's over Egypt. He's, he's read the dreams. He's now second in command. There's famine in the land. And his family is starving in Canaan. There's, his family is starving in their homeland. And so jo- Jacob sends his sons to go get some food. And they walk up before the, the Pharaoh's right hand who controls all of it. Little do they know it was his brother. And they ask for food, and they, you can read the rest of that story, and you kind of see the exchange. And they didn't know for a while. Joseph says, go grab your younger brother, all this stuff. I encourage you to go back and read it. But when Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers, imagine the shock. Or imagine the shock of, of Joseph standing there living out the God dream that had been placed inside of him. When he is sitting on his throne, most likely you know, pretty high ahead of you know, the, the, the slaves that would come in, the people that would come in. They were all looked down upon by the Egyptians, anybody besides Egyptians. Imagine watching his brothers come through the door and bow before him. Right? He's living in the middle of his dream. He's been living in the middle of, the, of the, the completion of what God had placed inside of him in the beginning. And that's powerful. And I imagine just, it says Joseph at different points, like, went away and wept, right? He just was just overwhelmed that he was actually in this moment in this time. And finally, throughout all the process, Joseph reveals himself, and this is in Genesis 45, 3 through 8, and I want to read it. Um, it says, he says, I'm Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? I mean, just imagine like popping out of a cake. It's me! Um, sorry, I'm weird. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. Right? They, they had bad things to say about him, and they hated him in his heart. You know, years and years ago before that. But now they're speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. And so they came closer. And he said to them again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset. Don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives, right? And we read that, and it's, it's, we can easily run into the line of like, okay, God was the one that wanted David to, you know, or Joseph to be a slave. It was God. Well, no, it was God working through humanity's choices, right? It was God working through humanity's choices, his brother's choices, and it was David's integrity through it all that activated and that allowed God to continue to work through it. He says, it was God that brought me to this place. Don't be angry with yourself. He says, this famine has landed, ravaged the land for two years, and it will last five more years, and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. God has sent me ahead of you. Imagine that, right? He could have easily revealed himself and said, hey, put these guys in chains. These guys sold me. I'm going to sell them. Right? He could have said, hey, these guys are bad people. Take them out. And he killed them right there. But instead, he trusted that God had brought him to this place for this reason, for this purpose. He said, so it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to, to Pharaoh, the manager of, her, manager of his entire palace. 
and the governor of all Egypt. You see, the setbacks that Joseph was facing were all setups, right? They were all setups for him to, to, to do that. You see, Joseph's life was chock full of setbacks, right? It was full of dreams, many of, many of which he didn't understand and how they would come to pass. And honestly, apart from God, were impossible. Apart from God, they were impossible. He couldn't, he couldn't have accomplished those, but he kept those dreams in his heart and he kept them there and he trusted God that he was going to work those dreams out. You see, his life was full of betrayal by his brothers, by Potiphar's wife, by the, the baker and the cupbearer. Obviously, it's not the baker's fault, but he was full of betrayal, he was full of setbacks. But for God, the setbacks were all just setups for his ultimate glory. And that's your next blank. Our setbacks are setups for God. What if we begin to look at our setbacks in our life as setups for God? to show up, as setups for God to reveal himself, as opportunities for God to be made whole and made, be made true and shown through our lives, that we can become an accurate reflection of Jesus because of our setbacks. You see, it's on the platform of our setbacks that God creates his greatest setups, not contingent on our power or our abilities, but upon his faithfulness and grace. It's upon those so instead of looking at setbacks in our lives, we look at them as setups. And so with that in mind, what can we gain from this story? What can we gain from Joseph's story? How can we apply this to ourselves today? Because maybe today you're in the middle of a setback. Maybe today you feel set up in a circumstance. Maybe today you feel like this is speaking right to you. That's what I've been praying, that God would speak to some hearts today. Maybe you've been listening and you're like, I know somebody in my life who needs to hear this. And a lot of times God speaks to us or speaks to us to tell others. And so today, as you, as you process this, as you respond, as you hear this, and as you hear God's voice through his scripture, be sure to be activated in it. And so with that in mind, what can we gain from the story? The first one is this, that God can use us despite our family history. God can use us despite our family history. Despite our, 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 the craziness of Joseph's family, God was orchestrating his plan for humanity. Right? We see that this, this book, this, uh, these stories, the scripture, is the story of God intersecting humanity with his, li with his life and forever saving plan. Right? That's what God is doing, and that's what God was doing through Joseph, and it looked like a hot mess. Right? Like I said, it looked like a soap opera. It looked crazy. But God was working in it, and he's still working in it. He's still working in our plans. He's still working in our lives. God can use us despite our family history. The next one is that our setbacks are overcome through integrity. Our setbacks are overcome through integrity. Your greatest asset in your life isn't your bank account. Your greatest asset is your integrity, right? It, David's, Joseph's great, great, greatest asset when he was going through all these setbacks, these trials, these tribulations, these circumstances, wasn't that he had massive amounts of money, wasn't, wasn't that he had this sweet robe because that didn't get him anywhere. It was his integrity. And it's oftentimes when we face these setbacks, when we face these trials, when we face this pain that the enemy says, all right, it's, he starts attacking us in our integrity. He starts coming at us. Maybe, well, you know what? I deserve to lean back into that addiction. Or I deserve to be angry at the world. That's me. That's where I wanted to fall to. I just want to be mad. My wife will tell you. Like, that'd be my easy default. Let's just be mad. Right? It's easy for us to default back in there and let our integrity begin to slide. But Joseph said, no, I'm going to honor God. I'm going to do my job well. I'm going to be honest. And because of that, the Lord was with him. And because of that, the people around him were blessed. Because of his integrity. We have to overcome our setbacks with integrity. We have to be people of integrity. So whatever trial, whatever setback you're facing now, think about the opportunities. Think about the times or maybe you've lapsed in your integrity or fudged a number or lied or said something rude. Or think about the other side of it when you said, you know what, I'm gonna hold true. I'm gonna stick to the plan. I'm gonna stick to the Lord's side on this and I'm gonna honor him and I'm gonna live a life that's honorable to him and I'm gonna make him known, not myself known. Joseph was never elevating himself. He was just saying, okay, I'm gonna be God's instrument wherever God takes me. Our setbacks are overcome through integrity. And the last one is that God knows the whole picture. God knows the whole picture. 
He knows the story he's writing. He knew what he was writing with, with Joseph's life, the, the future that we would experience because of Joseph, because of Jesus, because of all of those people. God knows the whole picture. And I, I've been meditating a lot on Psalms 23. Many of you might know it, but I want to read it this morning. And as we look at this and just kind of look at it through the lens of, of this today, it's not in your notes, it's not on the slides, but just listen with me. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me besides peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Man, sounds like Joseph, right? God was honored because of Joseph's life. He says, even when I walk through the darkest valleys, and I can imagine that prison that Joseph sat in, right? Prison back in the day was a hole and a cave dug into stone. Right? Like that's like maximum security. That's a, it's, you're in a mountain. It says, even when I walk through the darkest valleys, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I love that, that you are with me, right? It doesn't say that he's going to take us over the valleys. Sometimes he might, right? There's a verse of Isaiah that says, you give me wings like eagles, and I, I want some wings sometimes. I want to fly. But sometimes we have to walk through the valleys. We have to walk through the crushing and the pressing, as that song says, just as Joseph did, and trust that God is with us, and I love that idea that, he, that you, that God, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Right, where the enemy would think you're the weakest, in the middle of the valley, when you're eating your food, when you feel like you got nothing, when you feel the lowest, when the enemy's like looking on, like ready to attack, God's like, no, I'm gonna make a dinner for you here. Right, do you guys see the power in that? At your weakest, God's preparing a feast. At your weakest point, when the enemy thinks he has the greatest advantage of your life, no. God's saying, I'm right there. He ain't going to touch this. He's just going to watch you eat. Not today, Satan, right? I love this quote, and I'll end it here and bring it to us to a close this, this morning. It's a quote by, attributed to a rabbi. And uh, he says, a man should keep two rocks in his pocket. One rock saying that, saying, you are dust and ashes. The other rock saying, because of you, everything was made. And so one rock signifying that you are dust and ashes, that you're basically nothing. And one rock reminding you that because of you, everything was made. Allow that to sink in. Allow that to sink in as you process your journey, as you work through your setbacks, as you process being set up for different things, allow God to use those. And so today, as we close out in the lobby of these doors, there's a black frame, there's a, or there's a black curtain, there's a white frame, like a Polaroid picture. And the thing we do at grad season is everyone takes pictures, right? It's like, take a picture, because I'm 18 and I graduated, here's my gown, cool, I'm never gonna use it again. We take pictures that says, this marks a moment. This marks a time in history when I accomplish something. And so today, as you walk out, I encourage you guys, go out there and take a picture. And it says, you know, the big picture, LC, hashtag LC, or the big picture LC. But really that being a moment when you say, you know what, I'm gonna take my setbacks and offer them to God and allow him to use them as setback, setups. So would you guys take time to do that on your way out? Let me pray with you guys, just close your eyes this morning. As I said, I believe there's some people walking through some setbacks here today. That they feel like they were, they were right where they were supposed to be and then boom, they were hit with something. There's also people here that feel set up, that feel like they were told one thing and another thing happened. Regardless of where you're at, regardless of where your journey has led you, God wants to intersect your story. God wants to intersect your story. God wants you to know that your family history doesn't define you. God wants you to know that your setbacks can be overcome with integrity. 
God wants you to know that he knows the whole picture. From the beginning of Joseph's life, God had a plan. And Joseph chose to continue to honor that plan through his integrity. Continue to honor that plan, honor God, and because of it, the people around him were blessed. And so God, this morning, with our heads bowed, eyes closed, we're just sitting in this moment, we're just pausing to reflect. We want to take a snapshot of our life. God, the beauty of that technology is that it, it captures a moment forever. And today in a world saturated by pictures and video and all that, God, it's easy to, to get caught up and to, to dwell in what has happened. But God, we want to be presently focused in this moment. On June 2nd, 2019, God, a story lays before behind us. maybe of heartaches and setbacks. God, and your plans and purposes lay ahead of us. So Lord, as those two intersect here today, Lord, may we turn to you. God, may we look to you and allow you to be glorified in our lives and our hearts through our actions, through our integrity. So Jesus, we just thank you. God, be with us. God, may we be your lights into the world as Joseph was. God, may we be someone who walks through our setbacks, God, with our head held high, praising your name because you are, Lord, building our life. God, we're building it on you and you alone. So Jesus, we thank you. In your name, amen.